Meet Jack. Hello. Jack is his company's compliance and HR manager, responsible for managing the company training. Staff, however, don't share the same enthusiasm as Jack, and he struggles to motivate his staff to complete their training, especially Julie, who hates the training. Jack is worried staff training completion rates have dropped, motivation is down, and they are in danger of not having adequate compliance training if investigated. Jack needs a solution. Enter SafeTrack. Help put some colour back into your training with the five-time winner of the Best Compliance Training Program. SafeTrack consistently delivers the best business outcomes for online compliance training. Each training course is designed with engaging and interactive content that addresses learning principles to maximise the benefits of employees' training. Our latest innovative product, Short Burst Training, exclusive to SafeTrack, is a quick five-minute refresher course helping to reduce cost and time spent on your training. Contact SafeTrack for more information. <laughs> Education is the mechanism by which we're able to formally distinguish good HR knowledge and skills in the workplace. The means towards certification is through the RE Practicing Certification Program, the APC, which is a four unit postgraduate level program that can take up to two years to complete. HR is people. It's the heart and soul of an organisation. Good HR in our business is about aligning ourselves with the decision makers. Certification is an industry endorsement of your skills and abilities. Establishing a standard. It's about providing evidence that you've achieved that standard. I undertook the RE certification program to give me the fundamentals to grow into the profession. My clients know that uh, the service that I provide them, the advice that I give them, is going to be right. The benefits of being certified are to give me some certainty that the work I've done is recognised wherever I'm going to go with my HR career. I already am feeling a lot stronger and a lot more confident in the profession. I think it's uh, critically important that I'm able to, to step up as a professional myself. With Ari at your side, it's time to stand tall and be ahead above the rest. Welcome back. Yes, good to see everybody back up on their desks uh, for that um, final instalment in the certification series. Uh, a really important area of consideration and one which I'm sure will uh, provoke and continue a great deal of discussion long after this convention. Um, speaking of the, uh, of the convention, just a reminder, you've probably of course caught on to this, but uh, everybody has uh, wireless internet access in the convention. All you have to do is follow the login instructions on page 9 of your on-site guide if you haven't actually done that yet. Um, if you use Twitter or Instagram, of course, the official event hashtag is hash R-E-N-C. Now this next session shines a spotlight on something quite personal, on personal confidence, something that uh, I guess probably most of us, one way or another, would actually like to have a little more of. We're often told that confidence really is the key to our success, whether it's in life or in business, and yet a lot of people actually consider themselves to be hindered, actually hindered, by low self-confidence. Well, world-renowned personality expert, Professor Tomas Chamorro Premazic, is going to discuss very shortly the myths of low and high confidence. And we're quite sure that he will change the way you think about personal and professional achievement. Professor Chamorro Premazic is an international authority in psychological profiling, in consumer analytics and talent management. And with seven books and over 100 scientific papers published, he is one of the most prolific social scientists of his generation. He's a professor of business psychology at uh, University College in London, vice president of research and innovation at Hogan Assessments, visiting professor at Columbia University and he has previously taught at New York University and the London School of Economics. So to find out more about confidence, let's welcome him now. Professor Thomas Chamorro Premazic. Okay, 
Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me fine? Yes? Okay. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, as Lyndon Johnson once said, my father would have liked it, my mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, most of the talks around confidence try to emphasize the positive effects of high self-esteem. Um, this talk will do the opposite. Um, so it will highlight some of the discrepancies between how we mostly think of confidence and what the evidence actually show. Uh, sometimes I get invited to give motivational speeches. Uh, this will be an example of a demotivational speech, okay, because <laughs> the goal of this session is to make you feel less confident, uh, but actually uh, in a positive way. So there's still a little element of hinge of positivity. Um, as said, a great deal of uh, books, mostly self-help or popular books, have been written um, trying to highlight the idea that if you believe in yourself, Anything is possible. Um, don't worry about what other people think of you. If you think you're great, you can achieve everything. Um, even if you're wrong about your actual abilities. So all these books, all these essays, these examples of popular writings, um, in a way, are focused on making people feel good about themselves, even though they often achieve the exact opposite. Because when you feel bad about yourself, it's quite difficult to... Um, systematically or deliberately uh, persuade yourself of the opposite, okay? But in reality, there is no big problem. Actually, most of these books, the whole self-help industry is uh, uh, mostly having no effect at all on uh, most readers. Uh, they produce a short high, much like uh, uh, drugs or uh, other addictive substances, but no um, benefits or uh, significant effects in the long term. And in fact, the, if we had to summarize the realities about confidence in one line, this would be confidence is overrated. It's not as important as you think, but at the same time, uh, it's overrated at the individual level because most people think they're brighter, smarter, better, better looking than they actually are. This is the work that we covered in much of our research. So for about 15 years, we've been exploring the relationship between confidence how good you think you are, and competence, how good you actually are. Okay, and you can do this um, with any uh, ability, any skill, any area of knowledge, so long as you have an anchor, an actual uh, objective metrics on how good people are, you can then get them to estimate their skills, their ability, their knowledge in that area. If people were self-aware, uh, if we lived in a world where we are um, uh, capable of self-knowledge, of understanding our skills and limitation, you would expect a strong correlation between these two uh, variables. The average correlation between confidence and competence in any field, though, is lower than 0 0.3, which means that there is a very weak association. Most people are off the straight line that we would uh, draw. So 10% of individuals in the world tend to have realistic confidence. So they're good and aware of it. They're competent and they know it. 10% yeah? also are uh, realistically aware of their limitations. So they might not be good at something, not be smart, not be attractive, not be funny, but they're aware of it. Okay? Then you have 10% of people who we would describe as being overly perfectionistic. They are their well, worst uh, self-critics, their worst uh, perhaps psychological enemies. Um, and they uh, are better than they actually think. Even though a lot of research has highlighted that most of the exceptional achievers in this world fit into this category. You know, they are so harsh on themselves that they don't get complacent and therefore they keep on self-medicating for their insecurities by achieving more and more and more and more. That's why Madonna is still releasing records and sleeping in, a <laughs> in an oxygen chamber. 70% of people though uh, would fit in the overconfident category, okay? So that's, this is the main reason why there is a very weak correlation between confidence and uh, competence. So what we can ask ourselves um, is, you know, what implications this has on our judgment and decision-making skills? And even Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologists like Daniel Kahneman, well, the only psychologist ever to win a Nobel Prize, uh, concluded after a very long and systematic um, series of studies and research um, that overconfidence is one of the most pervasive biases uh, underlying human thinking. Okay, he says we're generally overconfident in our opinions and our impressions and judgments. So, I mean, what's there left, right? <laughs> we're overconfident about pretty much anything. And uh, this is really in um, uh, evidence in most of the biases or heuristics that Kahneman and Tversky have been describing or have described in their Nobel Prize winning work 
uh, the fact that we are um, very likely to feel uh, right about our judgment of other people even though we spend split seconds or less than a minute making our impressions um, uh, as evidence in prejudice or stereotypical judgments. The fact that we attend to information, selectively attend to information that confirms our beliefs and ignore uh, information that disproves it. So those of you laughing at this very bad joke, there's an inner geek inside you because this is to be an example of academic humor. Um, and, and at the same time, uh, perhaps the most pervasive bias, the most pervasive overconfidence bias of all, this is one of the few uh, consistent findings in the whole of social psychology over the past three decades, um, the so-called better than average bias, the fact that in any domain of skill or ability, um, actual competence or ability is normally distributed, meaning most people are average and some people are really good, some people are really bad. But when you ask people to estimate their skills, a great number, an unrealistically high proportion of people think they're better than average. Okay? We could do this now here, but we won't, and also I primed you, so you probably won't answer in the way most people answer. But studies have been done when people are exposed to this bias. Okay? So researchers have told people there is this thing called the better than average bias, and most people overestimate their abilities. abilities. Do you think it applies to you? And then only 20% of people say yes. Okay, so it's the reversal. So 70% of people uh, think that they're better singers than average. 80% of people think they're funnier than average. You know, sense of humor is a really good one. Uh, if you ask people, do you have a good sense of humor, 80 or 90% of people will say yes. How many people are actually funny? Okay, probably 10 or 20%. 80% of people think they're better drivers than average. 70% of people uh, think they're better lovers than average. Actually, some studies have been done using sort of 360-degree feedbacks with partners. It's, this, is, this is true. And ex-partners. And you can see a big gap between people's self-perceived uh, um, romantic skills and the realities. Um, so, okay, so that's fine. But, um, you know, uh, what's the scientific... What's the scientific... Um, um, kind of the compelling scientific evidence for... Uh, the nature of the effect, okay? When we have correlations that are weak, uh, it doesn't mean that there is an association. It might mean that there is no linear effect. And two other very famous social psychologists uh, coined uh, what is now a very well-established effect called the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, which, uh, um, uh, which uh, illustrates the fact that the relationship between self-perceived and actual skills uh, can be best represented um, by a U-shaped curve. Okay, so, so the simple way to interpret this chart is that idiots and geniuses don't differ very much in their self-estimates of abilities. Okay, so people who are really, really, really smart uh, would estimate their abilities in very similar ways as people who are really, really incompetent. Okay. Now, okay, but maybe there is still an advantage of being overly deluded and thinking that one is great when one isn't. Okay? Uh, this has been captured by a number of uh, urban cliches or very well-known uh, phrases, statements, uh, including Henry Ford's famous, whether you think you can do it or not, you're usually right. Okay? Meaning that uh, if you think you're not good, then those insecurities will hinder your performance. But if you think you're really good, that will have... Um, that would translate into higher self-efficacy and it would turn you into a genius even though in the first place you weren't a genius. Actually, we should correct this statement and um, you know, the way that uh, uh, we should reinterpret this in light of the evidence is that whether you think you can do it or not, you're usually wrong. Okay? And most of the work uh, that Albert Bandura has in this area, has done in this area, looking at self-efficacy as that surplus of uh, um, self-perceived ability beyond or over and above actual abilities didn't actually check for objective consequences, uh, for uh, objective outcomes or consequences of thinking that you're better than you actually are. Uh, in real life, we have a lot of evidence for the consequences of overconfidence. Most traffic accidents are caused by overconfident drivers. Um, most, we could have had a picture here of uh, Ashley Madison, you know, the... Uh, <laughs> Most cheating incidents or infidelity incidents are uh, the product of uh, individuals who were overconfident about their ability to get away with it. 
uh, most gambling uh, incidents are the product, especially pathological gambling, uh, are the result of overconfident individuals. Same applies for financial gam gambling. And, um, and by the way, you will see across all these areas that even though most people are overconfident, that is especially the case for men and less so for women. Okay? Studies have been done after the last financial uh, crisis, the financial meltdown, showing that banks that, have, that had fewer men and more women as traders making investments uh, ended up in better shape after that. So they were less overconfident and less risky in their investments. Uh, most addictions, of course, uh, have to do with overconfidence. If you ask smokers, uh, drinkers, or um, people who consume drugs, legal or illegal drugs, to estimate or, or tell you, report how much they consume, they systematically underestimate how much they're consuming. And they actually overestimate their chances of uh, being immune to the effects of these uh, substances. Eating disorders, uh, problems one way or another, similar, you know, um, things like body dysmorphia have to do with, uh, in one direction or another, have to do with uh, this idea that, um, you know, people are generally incapable of making accurate evaluations of reality, especially if they apply to themselves, because our uh, attempt or drive for maintaining a positive self-image is bigger or more important than our attempt or desire to know reality, okay, or get to know what the world really is like. And of course, and I'm going to spend some more time talking about this specific category, incompetent managers, okay. Um, I think uh, David Brent, Ricky Gervais' character in The Office is a great example of this because he's probably an insecure narcissist, so somebody who is full of himself, arrogant, bold, but not totally capable of self-deception, okay? And certainly not capable of deceiving others. So great TV character and awful boss to have, okay? Um, so let's have a look or review the state of affairs around management performance or effectiveness of leadership. Um, so at Hogan, we evaluate not just people's bright side personality traits, their capabilities or potential, but we also focus on their dark side characteristics or derailers. This would be uh, the toxic assets of your personality. Think that in the short term might have some advantages, but in the long term um, hinder your ability to build and maintain relationships. And there really are sort of euphemisms for personality disorders, or in another way we can think about these as manifestations or examples of highly functioning personality disorders, or people who uh, display um, fairly adaptive uh, manifestations of personality disorders. So there are three main derailers or dark side attributes that are much more likely to be found in corporate managers around the world than in, in uh, an average individual or an average employee. Uh, what we call the mischievous uh, trait, which effectively um, relates to being Machiavellian, manipulative, impulsive, and uh, uh, people who are mischievous enjoy taking advantage of others. Uh, the colorful trait, which would refer to uh, the schizotypical aspects of your personality or histrionic aspects of your personality, think Richard Branson, and the bold trait, uh, which refers to narcissism. Again, so corporate managers are 3.5 times more likely to exhibit or display these traits than the average person in the population, more so if they're men, less so if they're women. Um, if you look at the, uh, these scales in more detail, you can see that most of the facets associated with these traits have to do with overconfident, uh, sort of uh, being megalomania, thinking that you're really great, fantasize, I love this dimension of fantasize talent. And uh, we often refer to these traits or these uh, personality qualities as the charisma cluster. Okay, so there's clearly a bright side to this as evidence in most of the uh, charismatic uh, tycoons or leaders that have been portrayed in Hollywood movies, okay, from Gordon Gekko uh, to uh, Tony Montana and more recently The Wolf of Wall Street. Okay? Now, there's a, in, in movies, there usually isn't a happy ending for these characters, but that's because Hollywood likes a happy ending even if uh, they're uh, trying to highlight especially maybe when they're trying to highlight dark side personality characteristics. In the real world, we also have a lot of these examples. Um, in fact, uh, although Silicon Valley entrepreneurs were once regarded as kind of saviors of the world and uh, people who were very altruistic, and if you watch the show Silicon Valley, you can see 
uh, a very uh, smart, cynical, sarcastic take on it. Uh, there is no shortage of self-made billionaires or uh, influential politicians um, that uh, epitomize uh, these uh, uh, dark side tendencies. Okay? And we could, I could update this slide with, a slide with different people on a weekly basis and uh, we wouldn't run out of examples. Okay? And again, notice that most of them here, all of them except for Richard Branson's friend, uh, are men. Okay? That's not coincidental. But what is the state of affairs in or vis-a-vis -vis leadership today? Well, we know from various sources that most people in the world are not engaged at work, but they're actively uh, disengaged or not engaged. Um, that has been the case for about 10 years. Uh, in the U.S., these, uh, uh, this disengagement epidemic costs the U.S. economy around $300 billion in productivity. You get to that figure by extrapolating the difference in output between an engaged and disengaged employee. Here we can see Don Draper from the show Mad Men in one of his naps. You know, he just spends 10 or 15 minutes a day working and he's still responsible for most of the uh, great ideas and innovation that happens in his firm. So there will clearly be benefits of engaging him. At the same time, we know that 70% of employed individuals in the industrialized world uh, where unemployment rates are now lower than they have been in many, many years. 70% of uh, employed individuals are considered passive job seekers. Okay? LinkedIn, for example, considers that two-thirds to 70% of its 350 million users can be considered passive job seekers. This is a very interesting concept. It means there are not people who are um, actively sending their CVs or completing application forms online, but they're hoping that they can get a better, more meaningful, more purposeful uh, job. Um, if we equate this to the realm of uh, relationships, you know, it will be the equivalent of saying that 70% of the people who are married in the world or in a relationship are not actively trying to cheat, but they're open to better opportunities, okay? So they're hoping that something better comes up. Um, so it's quite a, a you know, significant issue. Um, other examples uh, would be the self-employed economy for about 10 years in, uh, again, most of the industrialized world where there isn't a shortage of job opportunities. Self-employment rates have been going up steadily. In the U.S., by 2020, it is estimated that 40% of the workforce will be self-employed. Okay? This is according to the economies, OECD, and other serious estimates. And then the whole phenomenon of the sharing economy is another example or manifestation of this. So uh, people don't just want to work for themselves. They also want to launch businesses. Startup activity rates have been going up for about 10 years, and they keep rising. And although we tend to glamorize uh, entrepreneurship as a desirable profession and desirable outcome. Uh, most of my MBA students today, they don't want to work for Goldman Sachs, Google, Deloitte, or anybody else anymore. They just want, want to work for themselves or launch their own business, do the next big thing. Uh, realistically, uh, their chances of success are very slim, okay? Uh, less than 5%. If you look at data, how many businesses survive three years or 10 years and actually grow is very, very low. And even if you tell people this, they're still overconfident about their ability to triumph as entrepreneurs. So why do people hate their jobs? Why do people dislike their jobs? Why do people disengage? Or why do they fail to engage? If you look at data from lots of different sources, you will see that the number one reason cited is always people's direct line manager, supervisor, or boss. And the saying that people join organizations, but they quit their bosses is true and backed up by uh, data. So why does this happen? Why uh, is uh, management or leadership in such a poor state? And you can see the other reasons, many of them also have to do with leadership. I think there are three reasons for this. There are three causes for this, um, you know, um, uh, um, sort of almost tragic situation. The first is that people are usually promoted on their basis of their technical expertise. So as the Peter Principle and other uh, people have shown, you know, everybody is eventually promoted to their own level of incompetence, okay? Um, and uh, there is a big difference between being a good individual contributor, a good problem solver, and somebody who can actually empower teams to perform at a higher level. Um, the second is that most high potential identification uh, interventions are still contaminated by politics and are still not utilizing 
uh, hard data, reliable indicators of competence. And most people fail to distinguish, most high potential intervention programs fail to distinguish between um, uh, emergence, the factors or, um, or uh, drivers that propel people up in the organizational ladder, things like being a good networker, being a good self-promoter, taking credit for other people's achievements, uh, managing upwards, and effectiveness, having the ability to truly empower or inspire high performance in a team. Okay? And so we work with a lot of organizations and most of our high potential um, uh, consulting work or interventions uh, have to accept the people that organizations have already designated as high potentials because they are uh, fairly certain that they have the right people but you end up with people who are um, well very expensive to train and coach because they shouldn't have been there in the first place okay and I would say when selection fails there's always training and development okay if you do selection improperly then you spend a lot of money on training and development so emergence signals confidence and effectiveness signals competence this also explains why there is a surplus of incompetent male managers anywhere in the world okay we can talk about um, we can talk about um, maternity or paternity leave policies, we can talk about laws, we can talk about regulations, but from a psychological point of view, uh, the main issue is not that we don't have enough women wanting to lean in, but that we reward those who lean in when in fact they might lack the abilities or the competence to do a good job afterwards, okay? So if you, if you go by um, um, self-nominations or if you pay attention to people who proactively put themselves forward in a role, if you, uh, if you believe uh, people's self-evaluations of their competence, then you will always end up with more men than women in any job or any role. Um, so uh, the fact that we have more incompetent men in um, management than women has to do, of course, with the fact that we have more men than women in management altogether. Um, but all these uh, suggestions or um, um, kind of, uh, um, yeah, all these suggestions or um, the, uh, the, the idea, the notion that uh, if women behave more like men, um, there will be more women in leadership, uh, misses the point altogether. What we should change is our ability to disentangle uh, self-belief from competence, okay? So in other words, we could reverse the issue altogether. If men behave more like women and they were more insecure, we would have fewer incompetent men in management, okay? Unless the system or the criteria, uh, the criteria change. Um, and, and things uh, are um, getting worse in many, in many ways. I mean, the whole strength-based movement uh, or approach to HR um, is uh, uh, the whole paradigm uh, that, uh, um, uh, that explains many of these issues, not just uh, our inability to distinguish between um, competent and confident people, but the fact that we reinforce people's self-estimates of ability instead of, instead of actually helping them have a reality check and giving them feedback on their limitations, on their weaknesses. You know, the fact that we can't use the word weaknesses in HR today. We can talk about strengths and developmental opportunities, okay? You can't say weaknesses. So, so you have candidates with more or less developmental opportunities. You know, hey, what is this candidate like? Well, they have a lot of developmental opportunities. <laughs> Do you have one with fewer developmental opportunities? <laughs> um, many firms in America today are seriously discussing, some have already eliminated negative feedback from their performance evaluation. So, so imagine, you have people who are naturally inclined anywhere in the world to overestimate their abilities, they think they're great, and what do we do? We tell them that they're great, and we don't tell them if they, are not, if they have some developmental opportunities. Um, so the state, the mainstream uh, leadership development industry today is in pretty bad shape. Um, this is a great chart used by my colleague Rob Kaiser. It, I mean, you can see a clear effect now, whereas in this chart, more and more money has been spent in the past 10, 20 years on leadership development. Actually, the figure is now almost 18 or 19 billion dollars. And you can see people's confidence in the effectiveness, on the effectiveness of the leadership development industry going down and down and down. So there's a clear effect here. The main reason is that 
Certainly in America, but this is exported elsewhere, the leadership development industry has been hijacked by the self-help movement. Okay, it's not the positive psychology movement, it's what's left of the positive psychology movement, which is a wishy-washy version of it designed to make people feel good about themselves. Okay. Um, so this has consequences. Uh, if you go from uh, organizations or corporations to uh, the realm of politics, or leaders not of companies or industry, but leaders of countries, um, for the past 50 years, uh, if you um, put a map of the world in front of you and threw a dart onto it, you would have had a 70% chance that it would land in a failed stale state. Um, that's still the case today. Most of these uh, states uh, depicted here in red have one common characteristic. They are run by charismatic leaders, again, mostly male charismatic leaders. And again, we could update this image uh, on a regular basis. Um, I come from a country that is currently run by a charismatic leader, not Angela Merkel, unfortunate, unfortunately, but Christina Kirchner. It's quite interesting that in Latin America today there are many female heads of states, but they have all risen to the top by outmailing males in terms of charisma. Okay, so this, the criteria haven't changed in order to be seen as a, a leader-like politician. You have to uh, display the same toxic traits uh, that account for the problem. Uh, do you have the show Wife Swap in Australia, or have you had it? Yes. I thought, I thought a while ago that we should do President Swap, and it will be interesting to uh, uh, switch these two people. Okay, so in a way you can't have anybody who displays, who is a better example of high confidence, low competence than Christina Kirchner. Uh, Angela Merkel, on the other hand, doesn't seem very confident or charismatic, but clearly very competent. She's probably the best head of state today, not that there is much competition. So imagine we do a show and we swap them for a year or two, and the question is, what would happen first? Can Merkel fix Argentina before Christina ruins Germany? Okay. <laughs> so it would be the best psychological experiment uh, to make. Um, Okay, and I said, you know, Argentina and Australia uh, used to have very similar characteristics. I mean, they're still similarly old or young countries. Um, at the end of the 19th century, they were in the top 10, uh, and in the beginning of the 20th century, top 10 uh, in terms of GDP. Uh, Argentina has systematically uh, gone down since then. It's one of the few, if not the only, perpetually devolving or declining economies in the world. Okay. But people's confidence is still very high. You know, if you meet an Argentine, they will tell you it's the best country in the world, they're the smartest people in the world, and so forth. So it's, a, it's perhaps because of this that I'm so interested in the subject. Um, just to finish off this section, there's a very interesting uh, point or explanation from evolutionary psychology about this phenomenon. Uh, people like Jeffrey Miller and other uh, people in his team have uh, shown very compellingly that over the curse of human evolution, you know, our um, uh, strategies, the abilities or tactics that we need to display in order to demonstrate talent or competence uh, have evolved in terms of their complexity. Okay, so if you think about human beings 50,000 years ago or our predecessors, it was very easy to figure out if somebody was competent or not. I mean, the biggest guy or the strongest person, you know, is more likely to protect you from predators and small guy, you don't want to deal with them, okay? Uh, of course, then skills have moved from physical, uh, from the physical realm to the intellectual realm, and now it's quite, it's quite complex, you know, to work out whether somebody knows or not, whether somebody is smart or not, whether somebody... So you need to develop competence yourself or increase your expertise in order to judge competence in others. So the point that Miller and other evolutionary psychologists make is, is, is very uh, intuitive and makes sense to me. The fact that as our capacities for displaying competence evolve, we also evolve tactics of deception and manipulation because it's more complex, you know, so much like you develop or you uh, refine the rules of the game, there's always people catching up, much like in the world of hacking, to make to, make, uh, the, uh, to create rules that are artificial and designed to mislead uh, people. And again, you can think of deception always in two terms, uh, our ability to deceive others, our ability to deceive ourselves. From an evolutionary point of view, the only advantage of self-deception is that it helps you deceive other people. Okay? Uh, the more you fool yourself, the more deluded you are, uh, the better able you will be to hide your insecurities because you don't know you have them, okay, so you're overestimating. And that in short-term interactions 
can have a positive impact, can be a strategic uh, skill or talent to have. For you, in long-term interactions and for the group, of course, the consequences are not good, just much like in the case of Argentina, Greece, southern Italy, and so forth. So, so what can we expect for the future and uh, especially looking at um, profile differences between generations and, and you know, cultural changes or cultural realities that we can see in the world today? So this final part discusses the narcissistic epidemic. Um, as you know, very soon millennials will comprise a big proportion of the workforce. Estimates vary depending on the country, but in the next 10 years they will shift move from being 40 or 50 percent to being 60 or 70 percent. Uh, you can read a lot of stuff on generational differences in the media and um, what you can read about millennials is quite confusing. Uh, lots of people, most people actually uh, spend most of their time uh, telling us that millennials are great, probably because they know that millennials will be uh, in control very soon and they want to uh, be in good terms with them and they're already quite influential consumers. And then you have data from actual psychological or scientific studies, um, which is more robust in one major way. They actually, when we look at generational differences uh, with scientific tools and publishing work in independent reviewed scientific journals, we actually do look at generational differences. We don't look at age differences, which is what most think tanks, uh, journalists, uh, newspapers, and PR firms do, where they give a survey to people uh, with different ages and they just do a cross-sectional comparison and they will find that 20-year-olds differ from 80-year-olds or 60-year-olds. Okay? That would always happen, but in order to disentangle the effects of age and generation, you need to actually do longitudinal studies. Put the people from the same age through the same tests, the same questionnaires at different points in time, okay? So how do 20-year-olds or 30-year-olds answer these questions today compared to how 30-year-olds answer the question 15 years ago, 30 years ago, and so forth? And only a minority of people have done that. So of all the things said about millennial, there's two traits that uh, have been um, uh, replicated or that have been uh, two qualities or personality characteristics that have been supported by uh, data. The best series of studies uh, comes from uh, work done by the social psychologist Jean Twenge. She actually evaluated over three million people using a clinical measure, so scientifically validated clinical measure of narcissism, the NPI, which is used to diagnose clinical narcissism. Okay? And so she put people through or looked at archival data for this measure uh, for the past three decades. And as you can see, um, as you can see, scores on uh, clinical narcissism, the MPI, have been increasing quite steadily over the past three decades. Examples of what this measure or what this tool evaluates. So there's questions such as, I'm destined to be famous in my life, okay? Actually, the data goes back even further. In the 1920s or 1930s, only 20% of people aged 25 would say yes. In the 1950s, it increased to about 35 to 45. In the 1970s or 80s, it increased to about 60. And now it's 80 to 85%. Okay? And other questions such as, uh, I'm good at everything I do, or everybody who I meet likes me, similar patterns. Okay? So, and it's important to understand, so these effect sizes here might seem small, again, that this is a clinical tool, and also that in general, you know, human beings don't change that much over the course of a short time, you know, over the course of five or six decades. I mean, most personality traits, most psychological traits are pretty stable over the course of five or uh, um, uh, ten decades. The only thing that has increased as much over the same time frame uh, are obesity rates in the United States. Okay. So they have increased. So narcissism is increasing at a similar pace, at a similar rate to obesity rate in, in the United States. Of course, you could argue that obesity rates are more visible. Okay? So the ob obesity is more visible as a phenomenon as than narcissism is, because one is psychological, internal, the other you can see. But I think you don't need to look too hard to uh, look at the symptoms, cultural and social symptoms of uh, narcissism. Okay? So, um, 
And you don't just need to focus on LA, but that's where it all comes from, so we might start there. So, as you know, in 2013, selfie uh, was chosen as the word of the year, um, according to different sources. 80% of all the fraud photographs ever taken have been taken in the past year, you know, and uh, as you can see in any event, um, and in any uh, tourist destination or attraction, people have their phones with them, but they also ensure that uh, they're included in a picture. This uh, picture, this selfie here made the news around the world. It's not just actors and Hollywood celebrities that uh, do this, of course, politicians uh, do this as well. Famous selfie here taken by the Prime Minister of uh, Denmark with Barack Obama. Barack's wife doesn't look very happy or impressed. <laughs> is actually paying attention or working there. Um, same goes for real uh, people or everyday people or uh, mortals. I have an article coming up in The Guardian next week. I don't know if they will keep my title or not, but I call it the public masturbation of self-image, okay? <laughs> Which is, I think, the only way, the only caption for this figure. And it's not just people or millennials, of course. It's sort of worrying that in some cases it's also politicians and the leaders of the most important countries in the world. It's, isn't it worrying that you don't know if this is a real picture or not, or Photoshop, okay? It's kind of 50-50, because it could happen. Um, selfie sticks are certainly uh, one of the latest abominations of this narcissistic epidemic. Have you heard of dronies? Uh, I actually have a couple of friends who already posted dronies of themselves on Facebook, okay? So instead of having a, I guess it's the natural evolution of the selfie stick. Uh, how can you apply technology to making selfie sticks more impressive or having better selfies of yourself? Well, you can use drones and put a camera there and take a picture of you or you and your friends uh, with it. So it's a drone plus a selfie. And, uh, and other examples as well. Okay, let me see if this is... Hello, speaking of technology, I'm being cut out. Yeah, maybe I ran out of batteries. Okay, there we are. Okay. Of course, we couldn't talk about narcissism, uh, a narcissistic epidemic, without spending at least a minute to talk about Kim Kardashian. Actually, do you remember Paris Hilton? She's almost forgotten now, isn't it? Many of you won't know that Kim started her career with Paris, so if you're interested in mentorship or understanding... <laughs> You can see that Paris was a great mentor. Um, it's interesting that back in the day, so five years ago, people thought that Paris Hilton, or 10 years ago, was very trashy, you know, famous for being famous. Yeah. And now, compared to Kim, she seems quite intellectual in many ways, you know? <laughs> so I think the concept of uh, trashy celebrities has always existed, but it's been strong for the past two or three decades, especially since the introduction of reality TV shows and now more since the advent or the explosion of social media networks. Um, but more and more it seems to be the case that um, if you're famous and you don't actually have any skills or any abilities other than being famous, it's an advantage. Okay? Or let me rephrase this. So it's a disadvantage to have some talent or some skills in order to be famous. Okay? That's certainly the case for uh, um, Kim Kardashian. And I think in this, if you think about the evolution or devolution of uh, uh, the trashy celebrity cult phenomenon, it's quite feasible to think that the next case study, the next, the person who would succeed Kim Kardashian will make Kim Kardashian seem quite intellectual. Okay, so it keeps, there's an inflation here as to what you need to be shocked or what certain people need to admire. Um, of course, uh, the same can be said for politics, and actually, you know, it's, it's, fairly, uh, it's fairly easy to criticize or make fun of Donald Trump, but I don't think he's a categorical or, uh, um, you know, a substantial uh, different sort of character than his predecessors, okay? If you look at American politics since Ronald Reagan onwards, the fact that Ronald Reagan was an actor and he was one of the best presidents America had, and the fact that uh, in, in, a, in a country where you have to be uh, media savvy uh, or capable um, to come across as charismatic in the media, what's the best candidate you can choose? A reality TV uh, politician, right? Or a reality TV contestant. Um, so, 
Um, so all this, I think, is symptomatic of the same uh, phenomenon. And let me just close or finish by um, um, quoting or remembering Freud. You know, it's in philosophy and in um, any area of um, human thought, we tend to say, um, well, it's all footnotes to Plato anyway, okay? So he said it before. I think in psychology, although Freud and psychoanalysis have been discredited um, for some time now, if you read Freud properly, you will see that most of the things we say today are really just footnotes to Freud, okay? Freud actually wrote about narcissism before anybody else did, at least in the context of leadership, organizations, and group behavior. And he, had, he made some very interesting points about the subject. Um, the first is, you know, he saw narcissism and uh, self-love as the psychological manifestation of our survival instincts, okay? He said, you have to love yourself in order to want to survive, in order to compete with others, in order to uh, be capable of passing your genes. If you don't, and if you don't at a pathological level, then what's the point? And then, you know, your uh, uh, death instincts will take over your life instincts. At the same time, you know, he made two very interesting remarks about leadership and narcissism that are often forgotten. The first is a so-called hedgehog analogy. So Freud said that human beings are slightly uh, paradoxical um, in the way they behave. So on the one hand, it is true that we are, uh, by definition, uh, or intrinsically or inherently, social animals. Okay? We can't live without other people. On the other hand, it is true that we're also very competitive and also very selfish. So he compared people to hedgehogs in the winter. Hedgehogs in the winter, they need to get close to each other because otherwise they get cold, but when they get too close to each other, you know, it gets a little bit prickly and they sting each other with the spines. So they need to separate, but then they get cold again. So they need to get, and I will stop there, okay? But you get the picture. So to articulate or manage that tension between our inherent desire to get along with others but also our inherent need to get ahead of others is the main role of leaders, which I think is a very wonderful uh, idea. So you need leadership primarily to suppress people's individual selfish, narcissistic impulses or drives so that they can be part of a team and work with others. And the implication then is that the more narcissistic, the more self-obsessed, the more entitled people are in a team, the harder it will be to actually create a synergy between those individuals. The harder it will be to squash or uh, eliminate uh, people's uh, individual, uh, individualistic and selfish uh, instincts and understand that they are not the center of the world, that they need to work with others in order to achieve uh, something uh, that they cannot achieve individually, okay? So, so the implication here is that if narcissism rates continue to increase, if the world truly becomes more individualistic and continues to go down this path, it will be a lot harder for leaders or managers to create high-performing teams, to actually uh, create organizations where people can work collectively. And on that very uh, happy and optimistic note, thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Thomas. Um, I, I think we've got a a greater sense of, um, please don't leave us just yet because I am going to just say a little, a little thank you to you and, uh, and give you a small gift, but I think we got a, a really greater sense of the complexities of confidence, uh, some of the, the hazards as well as the benefits of self-confidence and I thought that that idea of the, the vital importance of being able to disentangle self-belief from competence uh, was a, a, a very interesting concept. And I'm sure there are probably many thoughts that occurred to you during this presentation that perhaps you might want to, to follow up. Um, and if you're happy, we will take a couple of minutes for some questions. Uh, if people have questions, once again, of course, as usual, we have the microphones here at the front of the auditorium, also microphones uh, just at the halfway mark. So if anybody would like to put a question, that would be great. 
perhaps just while you're thinking about it, I could uh, get the ball rolling. Um, because it did occur to me, um, uh, as you were talking about that, that not necessary connection between self-confidence self and competency, um, I wondered whether there was any sense of a link between self-confidence and the capacity to move towards competency. Does it actually help you to move towards becoming competent if you actually have that foundation of self-confidence? Yeah, good question, and I didn't cover that. And, so, and if you don't get to ask any questions or have more questions that remain unanswered, they're probably answered in my book, which you can get, <laughs> which you can get from the bookstore with a signature from me as well, which makes the book a lot more valuable, of course. It can last one I think this is a very clear sense of self-confidence. <laughs> no, no, it's all, it's all very accurate. It's accurate self <laughs> Uh, I mean, the link, is mostly, the link is mostly negative, okay? And this has been uh, shown in various theories of motivation, uh, such as action control theory. So if you perceive a discrepancy between how good you are and how good you want to be, that uh, generates an unpleasant state of arousal. And in most people, they will try to close that gap, okay? which means that if you have two people with same levels of ability or competence, the ones that feel less confident about it will be motivated or driven to close that gap more than the ones that actually are satisfied or happy okay, when it's aligned. Uh, and imagine a situation where somebody thinks they are better than they actually are. I mean, why would they change? Why would they want to change? I mean, that's, uh, on the contrary, if anything, they might actually... Um, they might um, uh, get lazy and complacent and uh, you know, think they don't need to do anything um, to work. Thank you. We do have a question uh, at the microphone back there. Thank you very much. If you could just let us know who you are and then your question, please. Hi, my name, my name is Paula. I'm from Sydney. I'm a HR manager. I don't know if I'm demonstrating any narcissistic characteristics by getting onto the microphone, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask about, there's a lot of discussion in the HR realm about the removal of performance appraisals and the removal of 360. And my company recently just went through 360 and my impression of someone's competence and their impression was vastly different. So could you comment on this in regards to your research? Yeah, it's just, an, it's just a PR campaign, you know, much like uh, Sapos's and other firms' uh, suggestion uh, two years ago that uh, you can have a leaderless organization. Um, Sure, most performance uh, evaluations or performance appraisal systems are not very good currently, so we need to improve them. And most are uh, contaminated or polluted by uh, politics. But you will always need data on how people, or some in, um, kind of a, yeah, metrics or data on how people are doing. And people will always need feedback. So what are you going to replace it on? Okay, if you, have, if you really have cracked big data analytics and you have solid evidence that enables you to um, judge the performance of different employees, great, then you don't need to rely on other sources, but people also will need feedback. So you need data on how people are doing and people need feedback so that they can get better. If you don't want to call it performance appraisals or performance evaluations, call it something else. But I mean, that's going to stay and if companies really eliminate that, they will suffer. Thank you. Um, you first, sir, and then we'll, uh, we'll come down to you in a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Cliff Gillen. Um, Thomas, most HR practitioners would be well aware that employee complaints come in waves through decades. In the 80s we had RSI. What we're experiencing now is workplace bullying. This is a major topic and I'm interested in what you might have to say about the connection between self-entitlement and growth yeah. of feelings of self-entitlement and the rise in complaints from workers about bullying. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, well, you know, some people try to, uh, um, tell us that uh, maybe people are just reporting it more but things haven't changed, but I don't think that is the case, you know. Uh, our personality uh, assessments predict bullying predisposition and that will be the BOLD score, the narcissism score, especially, and this, I mean, um, people like Roy Baumaster have written about this uh, extensively. When you have somebody who is uh, a narcissist and they're confronted with a situation where they failed or are not performing well or you, you know they don't like the situation they get very aggressive and defensive and then managers 
uh, take it on on their subordinates and that's why bullying rates are going up. Uh, if we stop bold narcissistic managers uh, to go up the ranks of the organization, much like parasites or bacteria uh, you know, thrive in contaminated waters, then uh, bullying rates will go down. Okay? So you need to disinfect the system. <laughs> A bold solution. And our final question. Thank you. Um, thanks, Thomas. One thing I just want to impress upon... Sorry, could I, interrupt? could I get you to stand in front and this close? One? That's great. Thank Sorry. you. Um, when we're identifying between male and female leaders, quite um, relevant in your presentation, there's a hell of a lot of males in there. And yet you talk about the separation, obviously, with the, the female Argentinian leader. Is it the fact that we're starting to see some trends with female leaders coming through and they're identifying, they seem to be identifying with the imposter syndrome. So they are demonstrating the narcissistic trait, yet it's highly competitive to overcome those. What are you seeing the changes with male to female leaders and trying to remove that narcissism? It's a very complex question, you know, but, uh, but uh, it's possible. I think it makes sense, you know, that there is a little bit of that, of the imposter syndrome, and that's manifested there. Uh, I think the only uh, assertion I could make is that um, it's easy to be fooled by some of these examples, saying, okay, great, you know, because, because there are now more female in these positions, maybe that's symptomatic of the fact that we are more open-minded or we think of leadership in a different way? Not really, because if you look at the concept of gender from a, a psychological perspective in terms of more masculine, more feminine, and masculine and feminine traits, these are very masculine leaders. I mean, just much like Margaret Thatcher was not really a female leader by, in psychological terms, okay? So, uh, and then there is a shortage of examples of biological men who would display uh, some of the more female-like characteristics of leadership that have been actually shown in research to contribute to positive results. Okay, so we know there's evidence from meta-analysis that on average women are more likely to be transformational, that women have higher EQ, that they have higher empathy, and that all these uh, qualities or attributes contribute to positive evaluations in 360s and contributes to better group results. Okay, so since women are more likely to display uh, these characteristics. If anything, if you go by the data, there should be more women than men in positions of leaders. Okay, so I think vis-a-vis uh, -vis leadership, feminism is a data-driven field. Okay, so, and, but it's the opposite. That is also highly Sorry. politically driven, highly of course. Highly politically driven at the moment as well. We're still looking at affirmative actions in bringing women into leadership, so really, yeah. Is this stymieing natural women leaders rather than creating narcissistic female yeah, yeah. leaders? But you see, that this is the problem that we are, we are looking at when you impose quotas or you try, to, um, you try to enable positive discrimination or affirmative action, the assumption is that you're trying to help a group that is disadvantaged, but it's men who are disadvantaged for being good leaders, not women. So this perpetuates the idea that, oh, poor women, they need help so that they can be leaders. In fact, it's the other way around, but we're allowing male, men to be more leaders. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much indeed uh, for all of those questions. And, uh, and we have heard some, uh, some great responses and, of course, a great presentation from Thomas. I think uh, all of our self-confidence has been shaken. Uh, but in a good way. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, would you thank me again in, uh, sorry, join me in thanking uh, Professor <laughs> Kimura Premisic. Where's that self-confidence? To put colour back in your compliance training, 